And we're live. We're live, guys. Welcome to another episode of Good Morning Liberty, streaming live from here at the 10th Amendment Center in downtown Los Angeles in my home studio. It's Wednesday morning, 9.30 a.m. Pacific time here on the West Coast. So good morning to you, good afternoon, good evening, depending whenever you're watching, whether it's here with us live or later on in the archives. Uh, of course, make sure to smash those likes. Smash that like button. And of course, sub subscribe. Hit subscribe, whether you're on YouTube or wherever you hap happen to be watching. And uh, we really appreciate it. It helps spread the word and helps us get the word out. Our numbers are slowly but consistently growing. I have personally neglected this YouTube channel for a long time after we started it. So uh, just doing some regular updates has really helped us uh, get the information out. Our, our numbers are slowly growing on subscribers. And the minutes watched, at least in just the first month, is somewhere between two and a half and three times what they were previously. So people are definitely watching this more and more, and I really want to thank you for being here. Oh, hi to Pete Dolan. Pete, how's it going? Uh, haven't chatted in a while. Good to see you. I also want to give a quick shout out to Dakota and Steve, who both helped me with some tips on how to uh, how to get our YouTube account connected with our new BitChute account, because I want to support these other platforms that allow us to share information without the threat, or at least as of now, without the threat of getting cut off for saying the wrong thing. So we are automatically uploading every time once once we do one of these live streams. Uh, so you get to see it live. YouTube then takes about an hour to go through processing to update the codec for archive viewing. So depending on whatever device or browser you're looking at it in, it'll play and it should play fine. But once that processing is done, it's uh, automatically connected to our BitChute account and then BitChute posts it easy peasy. I am still going in and downloading and uploading to our uh, Reel.video account. Reel.video is run by a really good guy named Mike Adams, who's run Natural News for a long time. He spoke at one of our Nullify Now conferences years ago in Austin, Texas. So uh, I definitely want to support the hard work that he's doing to support free speech and other viewpoints with Reel.video. The uh, the platform is very nice. It seems very stable. Uh, we're not getting a lot of views there, but uh, we're definitely going to keep doing it. The goal is just same as here. To be consistent so people realize that it's there and continue sharing over and over and over. And this is what we've done with every platform that we've been able to build up. So our, our Facebook uh, uh, page is almost 350,000 people, which is larger than a lot of mainstream media personalities. And uh, we did that with just a handful of people working from their bedrooms or their spare home office. So if you can work hard and be consistent, you can definitely reach a lot of people. So today, I'm going to stop rambling about all this stuff. So thank you, of course, for being here and watching and sharing. It really helps us spread the word. But today, I want to talk about the hot-button issue, and that's this Supreme Court uh, hearing, the, the nomination hearing for Brett Kavanaugh. Now, he's getting vetted in public, and uh, people are either pro or con, uh, and they're talking about his political viewpoints or what team he's on. Is this a Republican guy? I saw from uh, the Tom Woods email newsletter that supposedly someone is claiming that people were throwing some kind of a white nationalist or a Nazi hand signal behind him. Uh, the absurdity of the level of argumentation about whether or not to approve Brett Kavanaugh shows how far things have sunk, in my view. And we've got a great article from Chris Ann Hall, who is a, a friend of ours here at 10th Amendment Center. I consider her a personal friend as well. Uh, she got fired from a, a job for being honest, for telling the truth about the Constitution. I don't know. You'd have to go to chrisannhall.com, K-R-I-S-A-N-N-E-H-A-L-L.com. I don't really know the details, but she is really dedicated herself to traveling the country, writing articles, doing shows like this, uh, and teaching people about the founding principles. And that is really essential. And so she's got a really good article. And I wanted to point out that there are a lot of people who are working in this direction. And we don't always all agree on everything all the time, just as a side note. But at least that the foundation is starting from 
okay, are they authorized to do this under the original understanding of the Constitution? And then look for research to, to say yes or no. Can something be done? Instead of just what is politically expedient. And that is really what's dangerous. And Chris Ann really gets into this quite a bit in her latest column on, uh, on Brett Kavanaugh and how to pick a Supreme Court justice under the Constitution. So I want to talk about that primarily. I think that's kind of going to take up the entire show, and I've got a quote of the day that uh, gets into it. So again, smash the likes, leave some comments. Uh, what are your thoughts on Brett Kavanaugh, Kavanaugh, the Constitution? What are your ideas for things that we should cover in, in the future? You can leave us a comment here, or as some people have done recently, shoot us an email to tenth, um, team at tenthamendmentcenter.com. Hi to EHP Training LLC. Chris Ann Hall is awesome. Yes, I actually got to. So we've been we've communicated with each other for quite a long time. Chris Ann is actually a member of the Tenth Amendment Center. She's posted pictures of her with her nice uh, Tenth Amendment Center membership card. I should have one of these out. Uh, so for those of you who want to support as well, it's tenthamendmentcenter.com slash members. So we've communicated quite a bit, and we'll shoot each other messages back and forth while uh, we're researching something or hear, hear some ideas on this particular issue, and we flesh ideas out. And again, we don't always agree or see eye to eye, but we, we start with that basic foundation of what's the founder's view on this? What did the people who ratified the Constitution believe that they were ratifying in regards to this issue? And that's the, that's the essence, and that's why I think her and I are such good friends on these issues. But she's a great person to hang out with it as well. Uh, EHP says she has spoken at her statewide Bama Carey Inc. the last two years. And she's really, yeah, she does a lot. I don't know how she does all the travel. Hey, Justin, wanted to say hello to you. Thanks for stopping by. So let's get into our, our first article, uh, this uh, coverage from Chris Ann Hall regarding the Constitution and vetting Brett Kavanaugh. So here's the article that she posted yesterday. This is on her website at chrisannhall.com. We did repost it over at 10thamendmentcenter.com. We actually sent it out as, as our featured article in our morning newsletter this morning. And that reminds me to plug 10thamendmentcenter.com slash register if you want to sign up for that. We send uh, this time of year one to two emails per week during the state legislative sessions when there's tons of nullification bills. Sometimes it's more. And you can actually pick a daily version, which isn't daily at this time of year. But in the state legislative session, it's pretty much daily while we're sending out news and updates. So Chris Ann Hall says there are basically four base. I mean, she doesn't put it this way, but reading her article, there are four priorities that we should be focused on when vetting a Supreme Court justice under the Constitution. Now, she points out that, you know, now that it's the vetting process has begun, gun, it's it's time for the American people to remind it of a few essential duties of a Supreme Court justice and the principles that ought to govern them. And she really goes through four of them and then explains in full detail. And I'm going to urge you, I will post the link in the show notes after the show's done here. I probably should figure out how to do that properly before I start the live stream, but I will work on that in the future. I'm also going to work on improving some of the lighting and the color of the light in here as well. So let's go through the four things that I found through her article that I thought were the primary things that should be required or should be the primary question, not is someone throwing a white supremacist sign behind this guy, not, oh, he's just a Bush, like... My gut instinct is this is the George W. Bush guy. He was uh, there as a Bush lawyer arguing in support of the Bush administration, making the case, at least this is my instinct, uh, for more independent executive authority. The Bush administration was terrible on this. The Obama administration took what Bush did and used it as his baseline and then expanded on it. And we don't want more of that increase. So my instinct is just that. So, But Chris Ann Hall gives me a good reminder. Let's just not focus on the personalities. Let's focus on what they're supposed to do and then make our decision based on that. So she says, first and foremost, this is number one, we need a justice that is dedicated to the Constitution. That should be simple. But that question doesn't come up very often in the political discussion about the Supreme Court nominating process. Dedicated to the Constitution, not ideology, politics, or personal agendas. And I'm even falling guilty to this. America does not need a liberal activist justice. 
America does not need a conservative activist justice. America needs a justice who is versed in the proper application of the Constitution through the original intent of the drafters. Yeah, absolutely. I actually uh, look at it differently. Well, almost exactly the same. We don't want a, an activist judge. We don't want a Supreme Court imposing a one-size-fits-all solution on anything, really, uh, outside of the constitutional structure, because that's dangerous. Because as soon as you do that, then the opposing side, what they end up doing is they fight their entire lives to get that same power to impose their ideology. And that's really where we are today. You have one side versus the other, and Tom Woods has called this many times, a low-grade civil war every few years. This is how he used to put it. I think it's almost every few days these, these days. A low-grade civil war of one side versus the other smashing each other over the head to get control of the whole federal apparatus. And that's not how things are supposed to work under the Tenth Amendment as a federal constitutional structure. The whole idea of a federal system with limited powers delegated to a federal government or a national government... The whole idea is that you have a large landmass with a huge population. It was huge at the time of 13. It's even bigger today. The idea is that what's right for us here in California certainly isn't always going to be right for people in South Dakota or Maine or South Carolina and vice versa. So you have this system where you have kind of this big defense umbrella where people of different ideologies, political, economic, religious viewpoints, can all have their own views in their own areas and live together in peace. When you have one-size-fits-all solutions, you create an environment where people fight. And this is exactly what they want, because it's divide and conquer. Justin says a constitutionalist judge would be considered an activist judge at this point, because these people are not interested in limiting the scope of their power now. Well, yeah, they may call them that. And I saw an article from ACLU, or they have this highlighted page talking about how uh, the Supreme Court, uh, what the Supreme Court should do, and it's very opposite. Now, some of it is similar to what Chris Hand says, but then they go into this whole section about how uh, a lot of people think that the Supreme Court doesn't uh, create law, they just issue opinions, whatever, and we have a post on our Facebook page saying just that right now. ACLU takes the opposite approach. They say, absolutely, Supreme Court does create law, and that's opposite of the Constitution. So where I only, the, the technicality where I see, read this differently than what Chris Ann puts is, uh, some people say original intent, some people say original meaning, I go with original meaning, my view on what the legal meaning of the Constitution is the original public meaning of what the law meant. Because no matter what the intent of the, the, the founders may have been, and most of the time I think this lined up because they would argue for and against, so people were understanding what the goal was. But where it may be different, it's possible in a rare case or a very narrow set of cases, and maybe we should do an article on this at some point where it could show where there are differences, where the intent of a founder, Alexander Hamilton is a good example, may be far different than what the people were convinced that they were ratifying, because the Constitution was still just words on paper until the ratifying conventions gave it legal force, and the ratifying conventions were representative of the people of each state. That's a very minor kind of, if you want to geek out it, type of difference. But absolutely correct, Chris Ann is absolutely right on, we don't need these activist judges. We need people that are dedicated to the Constitution. So whatever uh, Brett Kavanaugh's personal politics may be, the question should be, is he dedicated to the Constitution and approaching, even where we may disagree with it, is he approaching all of the questions from an originalism viewpoint? I don't have the answer to that, but that is a primary question. Number two, we, now, this is getting into the whole activist judge thing. We need a justice that understands the limited authority of the judiciary as established by the Constitution. America must break free from the dangerous ideology that the Supreme Court issues rulings and their rulings become the law of the land. We all talk about whenever we hear of a Supreme Court case, we're all guilty of this. I try very hard not to be, but it slips. And you can even read in the Supreme Court docket, their, 
their case numbers, their opinions don't say ruling, a ruling of the Supreme Court, because that implies that the Supreme Court rules. And, well, it's more than implication. It's very clear that if you say it's a ruling, then the Supreme Court is in charge. It's almost like the Constitution means what the Supreme Court says it means until later on it changes its mind, that the Constitution isn't the supreme law, that the Supreme Court, nine unelected, unaccountable, politically connected lawyers are in charge. It's almost like the, the situation or the, the setup in Iran where you've got these mullahs that, that rule the country. And that's not how the Constitution set things up. So we have to, to break free, as Chris Ann is correctly saying, from the notion that the Supreme Court issues rulings and those rulings are law. On the top of every Supreme Court opinion, it says an opinion of the Supreme Court. This is an opinion. There are also dissenting opinions. These are opinions. And the famous line, supposedly from Andrew Jackson, is that the Supreme Court may have their opinion. Now let them come and enforce it. And that's how I started our first ever nullification conference back in 2009-2010 down in Fort Worth, Texas. I talked about my views on the structure of the Constitution, and I pointed out moving to how to actually enforce it to Obamacare. And my view, and you can probably find this speech somewhere here on YouTube, was that the Supreme Court may have an opinion on Obamacare, but let them come and enforce it. Enforce it. Bring it on. The Supreme Court doesn't have an enforcement mechanism unless we allow them to. So as, lo as long as people see the Supreme Court as our rulers, we're going to continue having this problem. It, the pendulum will swing back and forth and back and forth, and some people are happy for a while, and they love what they have, and they keep pushing for more Supreme Court power until, and this is what the left has seen, until it switches the other direction. And it's only going to get worse. So imagine what it'll be in another 20 years. It will get even worse when the other side's in power and picking out the, the, the Supreme Court justices. And that's not how a federal limited constitutional republic is supposed to work. You're supposed to be able to have things that are other than a one-size-fits-all solutions. So Chris Ann goes on, and I like how she puts this. She's a lot more hardcore than I am sometimes. <laughs> Judges do not issue rulings. Kings issue rulings. Judges render opinions, and those judicial opinions have very limited scope of authority. So that's, that's number two, a very important issue. Number three, and she goes through some quotes talking about the, from the Constitutional Convention, and these are really good to read. Again, I'll put the, the link in there. The third thing. America needs a Supreme Court justice that knows that the con Constitution is a compact between the states that created three branches of the federal government, the legislative, executive, and judicial, and what that legal principle truly means. And this is a little deeper because she's talking about who's really in charge. It's not that the Constitution didn't create the states. It was the people of the several states that delegated powers through a Constitution for a federal government to do stuff. And that includes these co this court. So, again, uh, she talks about the power of the Supreme Court. Not issuing rulings, it goes even further. The Supreme Court should not be seen as the ultimate arbiter of the meaning of the Constitution. And Thomas Jefferson talked about this in the uh, the Principles of 98, the Kentucky Resolutions of 1798, which were eventually followed up within a matter of weeks by the, the Virginia Resolutions of 1798 from James Madison. And Jefferson secretly authorized these in opposition to an expansion of federal power under the Alien and Sedition Acts, penalizing free speech, among other things. And he pointed out that if... Both Jefferson Madison and Madison basically said, if you allow the federal government to determine the extent of its own powers, you shouldn't be surprised if those powers always grow and grow and grow, despite the, all, the vaunted checks and balances of the system, despite changing of the guard, voting bumps out. It doesn't matter who's in charge. If the federal government, or in this case, 
a branch of the federal government, the Supreme Court, determines the power of the federal government, the, then the federal government is, is going to be limitless in its power. And some people may be happy with the new administration over the previous one, and I know some people were happy with the previous one over the one before that, and you just keep going back. But if you want to really get some perspective at this, and I've done this a few times, and I've maybe even mentioned this, just think of Bill Clinton, for those of you who lived through the Bill Clinton era and paid attention. I did a bit. But think of Bill Clinton as a small government guy. I mean, the idea of Bill Clinton being a small government guy is absurd. And I know people say he, you know, this was a, a budget surplus or whatever positive thing. But I don't think anyone was arguing that Bill Clinton was a constitutionalist, that he was following the view of the founders. I don't think anyone was making that case ever. And I've never really heard anyone make it. I make it in jest because in comparison to $21 trillion, the national debt, huge deficit, $1.3 trillion in spending, in comparison to that, Clinton seemed like a small government guy. He certainly wasn't, but this just, it's just kind of, it's a laughable way of pointing out that even the worst people in time seems, uh, it's just nuts how bad things are going. So we have to understand that the Supreme Court doesn't make the final decision on the extent of its own power, uh, of the federal government's power. And uh, Chris Ann Hall actually goes beyond this, and she, not, not necessarily beyond that view, but she goes into some detail where she points out that the Constitution enumerates the specific powers of the judiciary in Article 3 of the Constitution. Maybe we should all read that so we understand it. She notes that the judiciary has no power beyond that specific enumeration, and the Constitution does not vest the ultimate meaning of the Constitution in the body of the judiciary. And even the big government guy of the time, Alexander Hamilton, so we can take this whole view of Bill Clinton being the small government guy and go to the extreme and all the way back to Alexander, Ham Alexander Hamilton, who was the biggest, bigger, big government guy of the day. Without a doubt. There were other ones that were on his side, but he was a big centralizing government lover. This, was he, this is what he wanted. And even Hamilton said, an affirmative, affirmative grant in Federalist 83, affirmative grant of special powers would be absurd as well as useless if a general authority uh, was, was intended. Oh, good to see Steve Smith out there. Finally made it for the live stream. I appreciate it. I actually just mentioned you. Uh, maybe I, I planned on mentioning you and Dakota, who helped me uh, get set up for the um, the BitChute Direct Connect. So we are now, I wanted to point out, Steve, that we are definitely connected where all of our, um, all of our videos here on YouTube, as soon as they're done processing and uploading, they go directly to our BitChute account. And then when we post the video, we embed the video from YouTube on our uh, blog at blog10 amendmentcentercom We actually include some alternative source links to Reel.Video and BitChute. So yes, I'm also glad a Ron Paul, or, Paul viewer or two made it here. I'm hoping that by being consistent, we're going to continue drawing more people in. And then eventually, hopefully, someone is going to take take the mantle and include a, uh, a 10 a.m. Pacific time. And we're going to have a block of liberty-focused uh, YouTube channels going here on YouTube in the near future. So we're going through the four things that Chris Ann Hall says are essential when vetting a Supreme Court justice according to the Constitution. And the last one is America needs a constitutionally sound Supreme Court justice, one who understands the supremacy of the Constitution. And this really is a reiteration of the things that we've been talking about in the first three. The Constitution is supreme. The federal government isn't supreme. The political parties aren't supreme. The Supreme Court isn't the supreme law of the land. It is the, the last court in the system, but it isn't the ultimate or final arbiter of what the Constitution means. The Constitution means what the Constitution means even when the Supreme Court gets it wrong. So the meaning doesn't change. It's just that people make errors. So Chris Ann points out, number four, 
America needs a constitutionally sound Supreme Court justice, one who understands the supremacy of the Constitution, the limited and defined nature of the authority of the judiciary, and why strict adherence to these principles is the only means by which the American people can truly live up to the standards that America was founded upon. So this is an excellent article. I'm just giving you the highlights. I, I you know, reading through, I picked out the four major categories. Really, they all tie into the same to the same message. Chris Ann, uh, Chris Ann, just keeps hammering through the viewpoint, just from a little different angle, over and over, that the goal of having a Supreme Court justice, the only process really of vetting that person is: will they adhere to the Constitution? Will they approach the Constitution from the founders' view, from the original intent, as Chris Ann puts it, or from the original public meaning, as I uh, put it? That's that's what we should be talking about, not the person's pol personal political choices, who chose them. It'd be interesting if there was an alternate universe. It would be interesting if Brett Kavanaugh had been chosen by Barack Obama. What would have been the opposition? I'm assuming the right would have, at least the, the mindless establishment right, would have opposed him based on just the fact that it was Obama choosing him. Just like a lot of the establishment left opposes anything that anyone that Trump would propose. And that, I think, is really the problem, where people have just kind of devolved into these camps of Democrat versus Republican. We see the same kind of thing playing out in these protests over Nike and In-N-Out Burger, In-N-Out, which I don't get to eat very often because it's not that good for you, but it's really good. But I wouldn't go to In-N-Out because they donate to Republicans. And I'm not going to not go to In-N-Out because they don't donate to Republicans or they donate to Democrats. I mean, I like the idea of using protests and that becoming a bigger part of the structure of the general public. But the protests are so absurd and mindless. The protests over Kavanaugh are pretty absurd and mindless. The protests over Nike, over in and out are just based on political personality issues. Team A versus Team B not about the Constitution. Even, even the Nike protests isn't about the Constitution. It's about Team America. And we're not supposed to be cheering for or against a team. We're supposed to be cheering for or against our own liberty. And the Constitution, while not a libertarian document, creates a foundation where liberty has a chance. So... Uh, Steve points out, very cool, I have to get a new computer sometime today. Oh, the computer doesn't work for BitChute. Wow, that's interesting. Okay, well, maybe because it's on a torrent system or something. But yeah, I'm really glad that we're on there. And now that it's automated, it'll be really easy, whether for our live streams or for uh, ones that we post in the archive. We do a weekly video from either Mike Meharry or myself about uh, two to three minutes sharing various uh, constitutional or current events issues. Justin says, yeah, just a bunch of screaming. And it's really sad because uh, the people on the left who oppose Kavanaugh, they're talking about, oh, someone's flashing a white supremacist sign. Like The insanity of this. Instead of focusing on, oh, this guy really believes in the, the unitary executive theory, that the executive branch can make all these decisions just as they want. I mean, I'm not sure if that's necessarily the case. These are some of the charges that I've seen in certain quarters. But why not have that discussion? Why not have a discussion about his views on mass surveillance? Because it's it really just insane. Why not have views on their actions based on the Constitution? War powers, the right to keep and bear arms, the Fourth Amendment, all of it, Tenth Amendment. I mean, why isn't the left who, who rightly attacked Jeff Sessions for his desire to ramp up against the Tenth Amendment, the war on marijuana, the prohibition, the federal prohibition? He wants to fully enforce that. He also wants to ramp up asset forfeiture. And, it, and this doesn't mean it's not being mentioned. But in my mind, why not talk about that? 
Oh, what would you do on Gonzalez versus Rach, which said that if you grow a plant in your backyard and you consume it in your home and you never buy or sell it, that somehow this is interstate commerce? Well, because both sides have used this when uh, the right was in power at that time and Justice Scalia wrote the majority in that opinion. Many people from the conservative side of the spectrum liked centralized central federal power to stop people from using marijuana. Well, years later, in the famous Obamacare, NFIB versus Sibelius, the people who wanted centralized power to have Obamacare, one of the main citations that they used in their arguments was the Gonzalez versus Rage case, the anti-weed case, to create a foundation to allow for nationalized health care. And this is nuts. No one wants to oppose the things that they supposedly say they support or oppose. And they focus on these political considerations because when you oppose more power, then you're opposing your own team having that power. And I think that might be the base problem that we're facing here. So Chris Ann Hall's article is amazing. If you are on our email newsletter list, hopefully it's not getting filtered. I learned that Apple email addresses, iCloud, Mac.com, and Me.com started blocking our emails a few weeks ago. We have gone through a process and unblocked them, but a number of people, maybe uh, a couple hundred, actually got removed from our list. So if you've got any of those email addresses uh, as your domain, we're going to probably try to get you an update somehow to let you know how you can resubscribe. But we uh, did send out did send out this article through our email list. Uh, but I will post a link to Chris Ann's uh, article directly as well. I also want to put this quote here from Charles Burris, who's a longtime blogger over at lourockwell.com. And he points out, and this is talking about the specific powers, it's imperative that the American people not acquiesce their grave responsibility, but forcefully press for their elected senators and the news media to question and hold fully accountable for this nominee for his viewpoint, his specific viewpoint on vital national security issues such as the constitutional power to declare war, habeas corpus, warrantless detention, indefinite detention under the NDAA, warrantless surveillance, torture, rendition, national security letters, and the constitutionality of continuity of government and covert operations of intelligence agencies. Whatever your viewpoint on any of those particular items, good on Charles Burris for pointing out a number of issues that should be front and center, not whether someone is throwing hand signals as a dog whistle to Nazis, right? So that's our view, and I agree absolutely on this is, should be the perspective on the Supreme Court justice. Unfortunately, that's not how it's going to play out, but hopefully we're going to get the word out to enough people to, to at least get this into the conversation. So before we head out today, and of course, I do want to thank everyone who's joined us, EHP Training, LLC, Justin Bayola, Steve Smith, and everyone else who is watching. Pete Dolan, thank you so much for being here. Make sure to smash the likes, continue leaving comments, whether it's either here in the live stream or later on in the archives. But let's go with this uh, quote of the day. And this is a tweet that we posted, I think it was yesterday, that we should reject, resist, and nullify unconstitutional acts at every turn without waiting for permission to do so from the Supreme Court. It comes from St. George Tucker, and he says, if they exceed the limits which the Constitution prescribes, quote, Every such act is treason against the sovereignty of the people. That was from 1803, and it's time to treat it that way. So again, I really hope you learned something here or maybe just kind of reignited your flame for, uh, or your perspective on how to view this whole Kavanaugh hearing process. I know I'm very grateful for Chris Ann's article because I was basically kind of just stepping back from it. And I think that's part of what happens with a lot of people when the uh, the discussion is so debased to these nonsensical arguments. It really disgusts me that people aren't talking about the mass surveillance much. Rand Paul did a little bit, then he had a private meeting and somehow uh, that's no longer a problem. Unfortunately, I think it is a problem. But what about the, the declaration, declaration of war, the power to declare war? Can the president just do that without Congress, as the president has said for so so long, and as the Bush administration really, really pushed, 
when Kavanaugh was a Bush administration lawyer? These are the questions that should come up. And I have been kind of pulled back from that because there is not there isn't much conversation about that. So I'm grateful for Chris Ann Hall's article. I hope that kind of brought it back into perspective for you as well, like it did for me. And I'm really grateful for you uh, you spending some time with me today. All the comments from everybody. Please, again, I'm going to keep saying it. Smash those likes. Hit subscribe. Make sure to continue leaving comments. And thank you so much for being here with me. We're back on schedule every Monday, Wednesday, Friday at 9.30 a.m. Pacific time. We'll see you in a couple days. Thank you for watching, and I hope you have a great Wednesday.